Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at Trinity Presbyterian Church. If you are newer to our church family, welcome. We hope this time of worship is meaningful for you. We want to point out all the important announcements in the bulletin, so please make sure you read those. A special thanks to Dana Ede for bringing us her and sharing us with us her talents of music this morning. Thanks, Dana. Please note that the parking lot might be resurfaced and get some new stripes this week. So if you come to visit the church and the back parking lot is closed, that's what's going on. And thanks to the property ministry for helping with that. Next Sunday, we start worship again at 11 a.m., So it's been a great summer. Thanks for joining us at 10. But as soon as September starts, we're back to worship at 11 a.m. throughout the school year. So see you next week at 11 a.m. It's Labor Day weekend, and I'm sure you will all be here. So thanks. At this time, please join us in our musical call to worship. Too young, too old, too inexperienced, too tired, too busy, too distracted, too angry, too anxious, too content, too set in our ways. We all have them, our good reasons why we are not up to following the call we hear from God. This is no new phenomenon. We have biblical precedent. Many of the faithful men and women who God called to do important work at first came up with reasons why it just wasn't possible for them to even try. As we join together to worship our Lord, let us remind ourselves that God is with us in the midst of all of our reluctance and hesitation. God works through us and in spite of us. God helps us to hear and understand what we are being called to do. Let us worship God together.
You may be seated. The Bible tells us that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So in that good news, please join with me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So hear the good news of the gospel and rejoice. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our brief statement of faith, well, our confession today is from the brief statement of faith, which is the most recently written statement of faith, along with the Belhar Confession. So join me in what we would call a contemporary statement of faith. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. It's the baptism of Jesus. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. 
And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Please join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, you are never far from us. You are with us each moment of the day. You are with us in the silence and in the sound. And so hear us now as we lift our prayers to you in the quiet of this place. Hear us as we silently pray for the needs of our world and the headlines that trouble us. Lord, hear us as we lift to you in the silence of our hearts, the people in our lives, our family members and friends, and the people of our congregation who need your healing touch. Be with those that will have a medical procedure this week. Be with those that are facing one. Be with those anxiously awaiting a test result. Oh God, hear our prayers. Holy God, hear us this morning as we remember those in our lives and in our church and even those in our world moving through a season of grief, that you might abide with them in their loneliness, that you might speak to them the promises of heaven, that you might make a way in their wilderness. O God, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers this morning of thanksgiving. We give you thanks for good news and good test results for Carol. We thank you that the news for Brayden is good. Hear us, Lord, as we lift to you prayers of thanksgiving this morning for people and friends and blessings in our life. Holy God, may our lives be a river. May we flow with the purpose of the one who created us and calls us, who directs our course, and who turns us ever towards home. Holy God, may our way shimmer with the light of Christ, who goes with us and bears us up and calls us beloved. Holy God, may we move with the grace of the Spirit, the same one that brooded over the waters at the beginning, the same one who will gather us up at the end. We pray all of this in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into our time of offering this morning, I want to say thank you for your generosity. Last week, or two weeks ago, recently, 
On a Thursday, we all went to Urban Air. So the families of the church were invited to go to a trampoline park in Cranberry. And because of your generous giving to the church, we can significantly reduce a cost of a trip like this for our family. So it only cost, there we are, it only cost $5 a kid, which is a bargain. And we got to spend two hours there having a great time. That is Officer Mark Neugebauer on the ropes course, looking great <laughs> up there. <laughs> this is a great time for us to build fellowship and community among our families. And um, dodgeball, who doesn't love a friendly Christian game of dodgeball uh, where we can take people out in the name of Jesus Christ. So that is awesome. <laughs> so that was good. So this is a huge thing, especially in a church where we have students in different school districts, even though many of us grew up in church together. When you have kids in different school districts, it's really important to have activities where we can all do things together and reconnect after a week. So thanks to everyone for your generosity. And I am stalling because we can't find the offering plates. <laughs> so we appreciate it. Um, thanks for all you do. We're going to have Dana just start the offering, and perhaps the plates will arrive. Otherwise, we will provide them for you on your way out. Thanks, Dana.
our worship before you isn't always perfect, but it is real and it is authentic. And it comes from willing and joyful hearts. Lord, thank you that we are people in love with you, sent out to make a difference in our community and our world. Bless the gifts given throughout the year and all of our efforts each week. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Great job. Thanks. Thanks. At this time, time we want to invite... Uh, we want to invite the children forward for the children's message. Come on up, guys. Sweet. So what did I bring with me this morning? Do you recognize what this is? Just yell it out. It's a backpack. Awesome. So this is a backpack. Raise your hand if you have a backpack in your life. Yeah? Yeah? So does your backpack ever get heavy? Raise your hand if your backpack's ever, like, loaded up with stuff. Yes, yeah, some of us. So most of us are starting school, or we started school, or we're going to start school soon, or maybe we're going to preschool, or hanging out um, with a babysitter. And sometimes back to school time, we can have a lot of worries, right? And those worries can kind of pile up. But Jesus says that when things feel heavy in our hearts, right? So that's like poetry. Jesus says when we're worried or we have a lot of stuff that makes us nervous, that we should give it to Jesus, that we shouldn't let those heavy burdens weigh us down. And so let's, let's remind ourselves of that today. So I need a person who is very strong. So, um, okay, come on up. Let's do it, Megan. Very strong. Do you have a strong back? Are you going to be okay with this? Okay, good. Now put this on. Okay, so remember, Jesus says, don't carry all those heavy burdens, all those worries. Um, instead, give them to me. So what are some things we might worry about when we're headed back to school? Let me, let me give you some options. Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. I am worried that I won't like my teacher, right? Do we have a thumbs up, thumbs down? Have you ever worried about that? Thumbs up, thumbs down, okay. I am worried about who I will sit with at lunch, right? Some of us, thumbs up, thumbs down, let me see it. I am worried that I won't get to school in time. Okay, it's getting a little heavier all right. I am worried that my friends might not feel like being friendly to me sometimes. I am worried about the tests I have to take. Uh-oh, it's getting pretty heavy. This is a pretty big one, right? What else might we worry about? I worry about who's going to be friends with me this year. Oh, pretty heavy. Okay. Now, okay, definitely heavy book bag here. So now I need somebody to be Jesus for me. Who's going to be Jesus? Okay, Laura, come on up. Okay, Laura is Jesus. And so what we do is when we're worried about things and we have a heavy book bag full of worries, Jesus says to give it to Jesus. How do you do that? You pray. You say, Jesus, I'm worried about my test today. Jesus, I'm worried about reading. It's really hard. Jesus, this math is hard. Jesus, I'm worried about who I'm going to sit by in the lunchroom. And so we pray and we give it to Jesus. So I'm going to take this off of you. Okay, ready? Okay, so hand it over. Pick it up. It's really heavy. Hand it over to Jesus. She prayed about it. She handed it over to Jesus. Okay, drag that thing away, Jesus. Okay, let's hear it for Jesus. Woo! Good job. Good job. High five, Megan. Good job. So when you're worried about something, adults, when you're worried about something, pray about it so Jesus can take that heaviness off your heart and help you have a better day, whatever you're up to. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, sometimes we worry about school, or about our family, or about something going on in our lives. Sometimes we worry about sharks at the beach, Lord. And so we pray that you would be with us in all of our worries, that when we pray about it with you, when we pray about it with our parents, that you would come, Jesus, and take all those worries off our heart 
so we can have a better day tomorrow. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Okay, the next time you put on a book bag, think about giving those worries to Jesus. Good to see you guys. Have a great week at school. Our passage today is also from the book of Matthew. So our first passage was from Matthew chapter 3. Our second passage is from the very end of Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 to 58. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus came to his hometown and began to teach people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all of his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask for eyes to see and ears to hear. Your will and your way for us to stay. It's in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we pray. Amen. Jesus at the end of a pretty great week of ministry, sat down at his laptop computer and opened his email inbox. And then he shrieked. 20 new emails in 12 hours? How could that be? And as Jesus is scanning through the emails, he is seeing that some of those emails are from, from some pretty unhappy people. One email says, Dear Jesus, about your parable on the fishing nets. Somebody else said, Jesus, your sermons lately have been... Somebody else wrote to Jesus and she said, Jesus, why can't you just respect the authority of the way things are done around here? One particularly mean person wrote to Jesus and said, Jesus, who do you think you are? You grew up in our church. We have known you since you were a baby, so you need to cut out all this talk about being the Messiah because we know who you really are. 
Jesus was not happy about that one. He was pretty ticked. He fired back an email that said, prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their home. Send. He later regretted that. He wished he would have thought about it for a second before he hit send, right? And so Jesus gets through his email inbox. He slogs through it, and then he slams the computer lid shut. He texts his mother goodnight, and he packs his bags because he is out of here in the morning with nary a miracle in sight. The story of Jesus' return to his hometown and the cool reception he received, to say the least, is a story that invites us into this question. Was Jesus human or was Jesus God? And why does it matter? So in the Christian church, we profess that Jesus is fully human and fully God. 100% human and 100% God. Now, our mathematicians and our accountants out there, they're scratching their heads. That doesn't seem to make any sense. How can Jesus be 100% human and 100% God? We don't know. It's one of the beautiful mysteries of the faith. So just enjoy it if you're a type A person out there. Just love that truth and live into it. So Jesus is 100% human and 100% God. What are we not saying? We're not saying that Jesus is 50-50, 50% human, as if he only has 50% of our human experiences, and 50% God, as if he only has 50% of God's power. Jesus is all of it, fully human and fully God, and it's a mystery, but it's also something that should give us hope and joy, because that means that Jesus knows exactly what it feels like to be you and me. He has had all of the experiences of what it means to be human. Jesus knows what it's like to be us. That is good news. So when we stand up and confess our faith, whether we're standing up together to say the Apostles' Creed, whether we confess our faith at a baptism or we're going to be an elder or a deacon or we're joining the church, we confess that Jesus is fully human and fully God. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in God, maker of heaven and earth, and God had a son named Jesus. In that moment, we confess Jesus' full divinity. Then we go on to say, right, Jesus was born of Mary, crucified, died, and buried. Ugh. Those are human realities. And so we stand together and we confess this truth. Jesus is fully human and fully God, even though that is a great mystery we confess it. And yet, even though we can all say that's true, all of us as human beings, as creatures, we all lean one way or the other. All of us have a bias. We either see Jesus as a little more human or we see Jesus as a little more on the God side. And that's not sinful. That's just what it means to be a person. It's just what it means to be a creature. So how do you know? What's your bias? Like, There are no theological moderates when it comes to Jesus. You lean one way or the other. When we read Bible stories, we're looking through a lens either of Jesus' humanity or divinity by default. How do you know what your default Jesus setting is? Well, I will ask you this question and then think about it in your head. When Jesus was headed into Holy Week, it's Palm Sunday, crowds, the whole deal. When Jesus was headed into Holy Week, how much did he know about what was about to happen that week? When I ask people that question, some people will say, well, Jesus was a man living into the master's plan. So absolutely, he knew he was to be the second Adam. He had to die. His blood had to be shed in order to offer us all salvation. He was the man working the master's plan. Those people who answer that way lean into the divinity of Jesus Christ. Because God is all-knowing, Jesus was all-knowing, knew what he had to do on Holy Week, despite the horrible things that he was going to go through. So on the other side of that equation, I can ask you, hey, how much did Jesus know about what was going to happen in Holy Week? And some people are like, well, Jesus wasn't the village idiot. I mean, he was aware of what was going on around him. He's headed into Jerusalem, tons of crowds, Passover, 
They're under Roman occupation, so the Roman authorities are angry. The Jewish authorities are angry. Maybe Jesus didn't know everything that was going to happen, but Jesus knew that things weren't good. He could just sense it, right? Tension in the air. That whole Garden of Gethsemane thing, let this cup pass from me, right? So people who answer the question that way would lean into the humanity of Christ. Jesus didn't know everything, but he knew it wasn't going to be good. And so no matter where you find yourself on that spectrum, just, just know it. Just know that when we read the Bible, we see through that particular lens, whatever bias we have, and maybe even challenge yourself to look at the other side of the coin. But whether you lean into the divinity or the humanity of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus was fully human and fully God. And so because he was fully human, knows exactly what it's like to be us on good days and bad days, on happy ones and ugly ones, on days the inbox is full of complaints. Jesus knows what it is to be us. And that is good news. So Jesus in this story, in Matthew 13, he's having a great week. Things are going well. He's flying high. Lots of great stories. This is where he'll share the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the weed and wheat. He'll have some great quality time with his disciples in this chapter, so that must have brought his heart joy. So lots of good things happening for Jesus. And then the end of the week comes. He heads back home. That should have been a joyous thing for him, right? Hugs from mom and dad, seeing his family. So he's, again, he's flying high. Great week. Things are going well. He gets home. He heads to his synagogue. We could assume this was his home church. He preaches what would have to be a home run sermon because it's Jesus, right? And yet they're mean to him. The people are unkind. They say, where did this guy get his miraculous deeds of power? That doesn't sound very nice. They say things like, isn't this the carpenter's son? Oh, this, this kid belongs to Mary. Oh, we know his brothers and sisters. They're that family, right? Oh, boy. And then what I think is probably the meanest thing of all, they say to Jesus, where did this man get all this? And Matthew says they took offense at him. Where did this guy get this stuff? And they took offense at him. Matthew tells us they are not happy with Jesus. The Greek word is scandaliso, where we get the English word scandalous. They created scandal. They were gossiping about him. They were calling him out publicly. It was a mess. And so what did Jesus do? A very human thing. I'm out of here. We're done. Matthew tells us Jesus did not do many deeds of power in that place because of their unbelief. He's like, I'm packing my bags. I'm gone. This is good news. This is a Jesus who is like you and me, who gets ticked off by stuff, who has people who are unkind to him, and it bothers him. Instead of responding with like peaceful words of assurance, instead of wowing them with miracles, he feels a little human in this one, and he just heads out of town. And so the question I have about Jesus in this story is when all of this is going down, when he is having a really great week ruined by some tough stuff, whose voice does Jesus listen to at the end of that day? Does Jesus listen to the voice of the complainers or the voice of the world? Or does Jesus listen to the voice of his heavenly parent? who called him beloved from the day he was born. The story of Jesus' baptism, where Jesus is baptized and the heavens open and there's a voice that everyone hears, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I'm pleased, that's not just Jesus' story. That's our story too. That's a story that reminds us from the day we are born, the heavens open, and Jesus calls us beloved, the one in whom God is pleased. And our baptismal sacrament celebrates that truth. And so, like Jesus, we have a choice every day. Whose voice are we going to listen to? The voice of the world? The voice of the naysayers in our life? When family conflict kicks up again, whose voice will we listen to? The voice in our head, in our heart of anxiety, or the voice of God who calls us beloved? We have a choice. Listen to God's voice. 
give God's voice priority, for we all are wonderfully and beautifully made. And so, may you rise each morning in your belovedness, and may you rest each night knowing that you are the beloved child of God, and when negativity comes, may God's voice speak the loudest in your heart. Beloved, let us pray. God, it is amazing how things can be going great, and then we get slammed with a comment or a situation we didn't see coming, and it ruins all of the good stuff. Some of us, God, are having a great week, and some of us are having a tough week or a tough month or a tough year. Sit with us where we are and speak loudly into our hearts till yours is the only voice we hear, that no matter what people say, no matter what happens, we are beloved, loved, eternally, forever, no matter what, by you. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. If you're going to have a sermon on the humanity of Christ, you better follow it with a hymn about the divinity of Christ, just to keep us balanced on the way out the door. So we have a choice every day about whose voice we're going to listen to. Listen to God's voice, calling you beloved every moment of the day. So go out into this world and go in peace and have courage. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, care for those who suffer, love and serve the Lord in the name of the creating and redeeming and sustaining God, and let all God's people say, Alleluia, Amen.